Redeciphering China's AI Dream, uh, a year and a half ago, I published a paper called Deciphering China's AI Dream, just trying to get a descriptive overview of what is happening in China's AI landscape. Because I'm really good at creatively naming things, this talk is called Redeciphering China's AI Dream and pointing towards stuff I got wrong, stuff I think we should be researching in the future. So the motivation is that this is not just about finding out what is happening in China's AI development. That in and of itself, the first layer, is really, really important. I think China is an indispensable player in AI governance, ensuring that advances from AI will benefit all of humanity and preventing risks from that development. So I think they're an indispensable nation. That's a term by former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright in the US, where she talks about transitioning the US from a hegemon to an indispensable nation, where the US is involved and has to have a seat at the table in a lot of these conversations. That's, and I think that's the case for China as well, for two reasons. Um, first is that China, probably by most accounts, has is the second leading power in the world, um, and also has the internet giants that are where a lot of the AI research is happening and where a lot of the AI capabilities are located. Um, so that's number one, capabilities. I think you can dis disagree about the capabilities point, and people can debate that over, and we will actually go into some of the, those debates here today. But point number two is even if you think China's capabilities don't mean that it has to be an indispensable nation in AI governance, it's perceived as a uh, rising power, and other countries will use China as a bogeyman type of figure or as a frame to motivate their own AI development, most notably in the case of the United States. So conversations about centralizing the US 5G infrastructure, the motivations for that were concerns about AI's development. Um, Mark Zuckerberg and his leaked testimony notes on it says like, don't talk about breaking up Facebook and AI giants and tech giants uh, because we need to compete with China. So second motivation for why we need a better understanding of China's AI development is it can shed light on China as a key actor in the international system. Um, what does China want? What are the implications for power transition, uh, relations with the US, relations with the EU, uh, how it will contribute to the international order? And third, I think it can tell us something about broader landscape of how technology um, affects global change. And throughout the presentation, I'm going to look at one slice of this, which is technology and national power. Um, but there are different ways of cutting that technology and people's perceptions of technology, um, technology and relations between people and machines. Um, but I'm going to, but it goes basically, it, it goes deeper than just what is happening in China on AI. And hopefully this presentation will give a sense of that. Um, Okay, that actually turned out a lot better than I thought it would in terms of putting a bunch of text on the slide. Um, is that somewhat readable for folks? Okay, I'm gonna interpret silence as assent. Um, so I think in those three layers, uh, China as an indispensable player in AI governance, what I'm gonna talk about is two problems, the tech abstraction problem and the China abstraction problem. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about how those fuel memes about AI arms races and um, kind of what China's AI dream means in an interdependent world. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about the technological change and the rise and fall of great powers. I'm not gonna talk about technological change and the structure of governance. I think I cut that slide after and forgot to delete that bubble point. Um, so here is the AI potential index from Deciphering China's AI dream uh, report a year and a half ago. And I think it is a good capture, it captures nicely how I was thinking about technology in a very abstract way, especially AI, which has become this magic catch-all term um, where anything is AI and AI is nothing at all. So the idea was here, we were trying to come up with a rough approximation of a country's AI potential. So we take a cut of hardware metrics, we take a cut of data, research and algorithms, commercial AI sector, and we try to come up with indicators that give a good proxy for where countries are in these different capabilities. The conclusion is that China's rough national AI capabilities are about half of that of the United States. I think this is like not a good approximation. And it was meant to be a first coast, meant to give an overall picture of what if a country devoted all of its resources to building advanced AI systems or pursuing an artificial generally uh, artificial general intelligence agent. Um, 
another example of abstraction, technology abstraction, is here is the Department of Commerce proposed rules for export controls uh, to identify emerging technologies that are essential to U.S. national security. So in these rules, there's 14 categories of technologies. One category is AI. There's other categories like biotechnology. Another category was robotics. Another category was advanced surveillance technologies. And what I'm trying to argue here is that we really do not have a good sense of what we're talking about when we say AI, or the US government, or me, or I think a lot of people in this space. Because when we're talking about when the US Commerce Department puts together a rule that was probably researched a lot, there's a lot of staff people there, they, got, they, have, they have jobs to do, and all the kinds of AI that are put under that list range from fundamental models, fuzzy, like branches of fuzzy mathematics, specific classes of algorithms to specific hardware. Um, you could even argue the other categories would be subsumed under, under AI, is robotics AI, advanced surveillance technologies, and corporate, and corporate AI more and more. So just giving you a sense of this is a slippery target that we're trying to analyze. So when we, when we talk about China's AI dream, what are we actually talking about? Um, so I'm sure... I think in my slide notes, I was supposed to talk about like in vacation Bible school growing up, that we learned like this song about like how there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. And so every time you all talk about, you think of technology as an independent variable, I want everyone to think about technology as a variable that is both deep and wide. And you have to do the hand motion while you're doing it. Um, and the idea here is two years later, um, in written testimony before the US-China Economic and Security Commission, they asked me to assess China's national AI capabilities. So I get another crack at the problem with one and a half years more experience and hopefully a little bit more wisdom. And the idea is, let's actually tackle the technology abstraction problem at its root. I think that, we, that with technology and with AI, you have to divide it up in terms of how, what level of depth of AI are you talking about? So are, are we talking about the foundational layer of the AI value chain, AI open source software, uh, deep learning frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow? Uh, of those, a white paper has shown that 66% of those are developed by US companies. Those have a strategic advantage for those companies because people get used to coding on those. They want to work for those companies and they're more used to working for those companies. They become a way for those companies to benefit from, from network effects to improve all of their models because there's so many people making improvements to them and a way to recruit talent. So that matters. AI open source software matters. At another level of depth of the value chain, you have the technology layer. So what are the, what are the algorithms, algorithms that you're licensing to different companies? Third layer, you have the application layer, um, the smart speakers products, the hardware products that are actually being sold. Um, so that's one way to slice it along depth. Um, and it can even go deeper than that. So um, a lot of people compare, let's say AI is a general purpose technology. So if we talk about general purpose technologies, we're talking not just about the application layer, the technology layer, the deeper foundational level layer, but we're also talking about technology as a system. A, tech, a system that, so other general purpose technologies like electricity, it's not just about the electric dynamo, it's not just about the electric utility, it's about how the utility connects to the factory to power individual electricity generators that are funneled through transformers and funneled through an entire system of electricity generation, distribution, and transmission and consumption. Um, so this is, this is a problem of depth, and it's also a problem of width. So AI is a broad category that encompasses a bunch of different domains. Chinese natural language processing has much different implications than um, English natural processing, uh, natural language processing. You might, if you say Chinese NLP is better than American AI, NLP, what type of NLP are you talking about? Um, can we measure different countries' capabilities in specific domains of AI? Uh, and there will probably be, vari be variation between those different domains. So a second problem, I think, in this space is what I call the China abstraction problem. Uh, the idea is that China is not a monolithic actor, and this has meaningful implications for governance. So this is one example, um, and I like to use the standard space as an example technical standards, the work of bureaucrats, uh, companies, industry alliances to shape 
what are the rules that govern different products and systems as they go on online to different markets. These standards shape these standards are billion dollar dis uh, decisions. One popular Chinese saying is that third tier companies make products, second tier companies make platforms, first tier companies make standards. Microsoft Word has, is, a word, um, is dominant because there's a Word document formatting standard that they achieved, um, they were the first to go to market with and it spread. So this is obviously a very important domain and there's actually a there's conflict and there's cross-cutting cleavages within the Chinese technology space in terms of which companies are siding with who on standards. So this is an interesting case where Lenovo, a Chinese company, votes in favor of Qualcomm, a US company, on a key standard for polar coding that's gonna be important for 5G, which is an enabling application for a bunch of uh, autonomous, for autonomous vehicles, for a bunch of AI applications. So there was a big, debate in China about it when this was leaked out, and Lenovo had to issue a public apology, say they didn't actually vote for Huawei, but these types of, say that they didn't actually vote against Huawei, but these types of d disputes and debates and cross-cutting cleavages, strategic alliances between Chinese companies and other companies um, are happening all the time underneath the surface, and we should, we should, probably, we should not just say China wants to do this with AI or China has an AI dream. Um, we should specify who are the specific actors with the China, within China that have specific intentions and capabilities. Um, but we have to say China AI Dream to make it a sexy title and get people to read the report. So I'm not going to apologize for that. Um, my argument is that these abstractions, and, and I don't want to say that we shouldn't be abstract. I think that being parsimonious is important for communication. Um, I can't, to write headlines, you can't just like, you can't specify everything. Um, sometimes you just had eggs for breakfast. You don't need to tell people um, the type of eggs. Or That was a bad analogy. Um, but the idea is that these two problems are intermingled with another dangerous set of assumptions, sometimes useful set of assumptions, but oftentimes dangerous, which is techno-nationalism. Um, and sometimes people just throw around the phrase techno-nationalism. This is coined by Robert Reich, um, labor advisor for President Clinton, uh, to actually refer to U.S. policy in response to Japan's technological challenge. So it's actually really relevant to the current debates right now. And um, as you see in that Brookings report, um, China, the argument is that in AI, who's going to dominate in the era of industrial AI, and the argument is that China is inventing a kind of techno-nationalism. So what do we mean by techno-nationalism? Um, I think that we should clearly specify what we're talking about. So one is the belief that technological strength and security are key drivers of interstate competition. I call that the techno-competition belief. And I think largely most countries believe in this. Uh, second is techno-independence. Some degree of technological autonomy is key to technological strength and security. So some countries might believe that autarky is the way to go. Um, so that's a very strong sense of techno-independence. Um, a weaker sense might be we need to not be dependent on a sole source supplier of, say, semiconductor chips. We need to diversify our supply so that we can be cut off. Some degree of autonomy and freedom. And the third is the techno-nation belief. The idea that the nation state is the primary unit of relevance for technology policy. And I think just to give a sense for how baked in these assumptions are, I think probably everybody in this room believes that um, national R&D, the amount of national R&D that you spend is probably correlated with your economic growth. Or like that spending more on innovation at the national level will lead to national economic strength in some form. Actually, that's like disputed in the literature, that we have good sense that global innovation tracks with global economic growth. Um, but there's arguments to be made that national level innovation, national investments in R&D might not necessarily translate to national um, level growth. And one example is that just technology diffusion happens much easier these days. We live in a world of global innovation networks where knowledge is being shared. So it's not clear the extent to which the benefits of technological development are captured within the nation state container. So that's the framework for what we're talking about when we talk about techno-nationalism. Um, I think sometimes all of those beliefs are 
rational in some sense, and it's, an, it's a way of understanding and thinking about the world that can be useful. Sometimes, though, when it's, it can be very much distorted, and I give examples of distortion in each of these spaces. So one example is a distortion of the techno-competition meme. To have a good sense of how technology is an interstate, a driver of interstate conflict, you have, to, you have to have a good sense of assessing where the technology is, how technology is actually incorporated into power. Um, whereas the meme now is that this is a Sputnik moment, China's advances in AI represent a Sputnik moment for an AI arms race. Um, it's unclear what, um, what these commentators think we're racing over. Is it a specific discrete weapon output? Um, is it about incorporating and enabling AI across a wide range of military applications from uh, including the non-sexy stuff like better logistics and communications and intelligence transmission? Um, is it about a broader industrial competition of AI? Uh, and, and the idea is that there, the, these Cold War analogies sometimes fall apart because there's not something countable. It's not about who has more ICBMs. Um, it's about, the, I, I think that the more relevant aspects of competition are going to be about who, the different types of technological systems that develop, which we'll talk about later. The second is techno-independence. So the idea is that um, because of China's innovation mercantilism um, strategy in spaces like artificial intelligence, the innovation, uh, innovation technology, I think they're the Information Technology Innovation Foundation, ITIF, one of the alphabet soup of DC think tanks that are often very prevalent in the space. Um, their vice president has recommended that in response, the US should suspend all scientific and other technical cooperation with China. So that's one model of techno independence in response to what's perceived as innovation mercantilism. Um, so tr uh, President Trump uh, tweeted, I think, in months earlier, basically ordering U.S. companies to get out of China. Um, and the idea is that to what extent can the U.S. maintain its technological independence? Um, is the solution to cut off everything? So this is an example of which these, these memes can be distorted. Suspending scientific and technological cooperation would probably um, also hurt U.S. companies and the U.S. innovation pipeline and also removes a good channel for uh, encouraging trust and cooperation in the space. Uh, Matthew Evangelista, scholar at Cornell, has written a book about the Pugwash movement in the context of the Cold War, where US and Soviet scientists and physicists uh, meeting in the Pugwash conference and having side talks and back channel negotiations, he argues was a crucial channel to reduce Cold War tensions. Third belief is the, the third distortion is in the techno-nation space. And this, uh, this is the idea that technological innovation maps perfectly onto the landscape of nation states. So Kai Fu Lee in the New York Times um, editorial, he basically says that um, companies will be forced to negotiate, that, that countries who are dependent on the supply of AI algorithms from other countries' firms will have to negotiate with the countries themselves. Um, not understanding or not, at, at least in my opinion, giving weight to the fact that these companies themselves will have interests to operate in other countries, that f the Facebooks and the Googles and the Microsofts of the world are actually trying, uh, do not see themselves as in, like mapping perfectly onto the interests of the nation state. And I think there's important differences there that we should acknowledge. Um, so now just to try to connect a lot of the things, I've thrown a lot of concepts at you, I've thrown a lot of terms at you, I've thrown some examples at you, um, some jokes that did not land very well. Um, and now to connect all the dots, um, I think the idea is that to tackle technology abstraction problem, um, to look at specifically what these have to say for the nation state, um, and what these say for stuff that goes beyond the national container, uh, we have to adopt a technological systems approach for understanding how technology and global change intersect. And the idea is that if you look back at the second industrial revolution, this was late half of the 19th century, the argument here for most scholars is that this was an area of Britain's relative decline 
and the US and Germany taking control in industrial power, technological power, leaping ahead of Britain. And the explanation for why it happens oftentimes is the sexy new industries of the time, electricity, chemical industries, Germany was ahead in all these new industries. Steel is often mentioned. Germany's steel output leapt forward by bounds during this time period. Um, I think those accounts get it wrong. I think they overemphasize the new t industries that took a really, really long time to diffuse, and they probably didn't make an impact on productivity until after 1914. And I think they're missing some of these less sexy, less visible, less consumer-facing systems. And one system was the American system of manufacture, uh, where you actually had machine tools that enabled the production of sewing machines, bicycles, automobiles, small arms, small firearms, all with interchangeable parts, all cut precisely with new like turret lathes, um, milling machines that could like form things really precisely. Um, and a lot of scholars point to this American system of manufacture as being the key to advances in manufacturing productivity and the U.S. increase in technological power during this period. So if we get to this level of technology, of understanding technology, where we're talking about systems, not just buzzwords, what can we think about in terms of China's AI development? And I would point towards maybe there's something like, what are the American systems of manufacturing that could exist in China today or will exist in China in the future. I think one potential example is the industrial internet, the notion of connecting a bunch of devices in manufacturing workroom floors and having them talk to each other, getting much more granular predictive analytics about when we need to do maintenance on these. Um, all very exciting topics, um, but also, um, all very boring topics, sorry, but also very exciting for people who are thinking about how technological systems will impact interstate competition and how we think about power. Um, and so uh, this was one of the latest issues of the China AI newsletter where we talk, where I looked at a translation about CASIC cloud, SASIC cloud. Um, and CASIC is like a aerosp one, uh, one of the key like state-owned enterprises who does a lot of tech stuff, and they're trying to build an industrial internet platform, um, have built one, and they're in competition with Siemens, um, the, which has their own system, and General Electric, which coined the term industrial internet and came out first with the Predix system. And I think that there's uh, that you know just as an indicator of how important this stuff is, when Siemens and SASIC Cloud work together. Um, to sign an agreement, again, going back to questioning technological frames and seeing that there's a lot of things happening underneath the surface of interstate competition. But when they signed an agreement to work together on these platforms, guess who was also there at the signing ceremony? President Xi Jinping and Angela Merkel. So um, this is, I think, it's not just about, I gave, I ran through this um, with all these kind of abstract terms and concepts and a roadmap for redeciphering China's AI dream, just with the example of technological competition and kind of uh, power in mind. You could apply this framework to a bunch of other things, like what surveillance has for implications for authoritarian resilience, for disproportionately targeting ethnic minorities, like is happening with Uyghurs in Xinjiang. You could apply it to a bunch of different interesting research questions in this space. I just ran through it as if, because uh, this is my interest, my DFO research on uh, technological power and competition in this space. But the idea is that this is a general model um, for looking at what are the problems in research, how we can, how we can do better, um, and yeah, how we can uh, re-decipher China's AI dream. So thanks. This is really fascinating and obviously super important and uh, seemingly kind of a, if not a fast changing uh, domain than certainly one that's uh, been kind of popping up in a few different places recently. Uh, first question that I was kind of curious about is, to what degree do you think the average Chinese citizen sort of sees China as being in this sort of nation-to-nation -nation competition with the U.S. or even just kind of the rest of the world? Yeah. Um I think like the average person just doesn't care that much about foreign policy or international relations. Um, so if you look at like even American voters, like foreign policy is usually like the last thing and it's all about like economy and like bread and butter issues. So I think average Chinese citizen probably the same way. Um, at least I can only speak for like my friends um, in China. I think there is some pride in like where China has gone and how far it's come. 
Um, so maybe there's more of a sense of China as a rising power um, to that extent. But I just think most people are just trying to like make ends meet, get a home, get married, do life. So with that in mind, how do you make sense of well, uh, with that in mind, how do you make sense of the NBA story from the last couple of weeks. You mentioned yeah. rap battles, so I assume you're following the uh, NBA story as well. Yeah. But for those that haven't, uh, maybe <laughs> everyone who likes that, rap also likes uh, the NBA. I think it's a safe correlation, anyway. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, so there was a tweet by a guy who's affiliated with the NBA, which is the basketball league yeah. uh, in the United States, uh, which does a lot of business in China. And it was just a, a pretty, you know, from certainly an American point of view, a pretty kind of vanilla, you know, supporting Hong Kong sort of statement. Uh, and it was made on Twitter, which obviously you know, yeah. the average Chinese person doesn't have access to right. or pay any attention to. Right. And yet it was blown up into this big thing. And all of, all of a sudden, all these partnerships between Chinese firms and the NBA were starting to get canceled and like games are not being televised anymore. And the sort of projection that, that seemed to be coming out of China was like, we are all very upset about this. Right. Um, do you think that that is manufactured and, and just overblown, or do you, or would you somehow make help us make sense of that if people don't really care about foreign policy? Yeah, I don't think like most of the 1.4 billion people in China were like really really upset about this thing. Um, I do think that um, this is something that I've actually tried not to follow too actively because I usually go to the NBA subreddit every day as like a nice escape from work type of space, but now this has become Yeah, well, welcome work to your new reality. As well. Um, but I just think, like, I think the, if you want my hot take on this, I think the NBA capitulated way too much. Like, so many of my friends love watching the NBA, and they would just find, like, another way to stream it. So I think, like, the kind of the business relationships, like Tencent saying they wouldn't stream games anymore, I think they would have, like, they're doing it right now. They're going back, and, like, they're going to stream games. Um, so there's just so much demand for the NBA um, that I think the, M the, the NBA had more cards to play with than, um, than they did. That seems to be this sort of like projecting censorship into other parts of the world seems yep. to be kind of part of the, the Chinese government's program right now. So I'm also a, a TikTok user okay. and nice. uh, get a lot of pleasure out of these you know, brilliant uh, 15 second dance videos. <laughs> Uh, but more recently, I've also been hearing how many videos are being taken down, yeah. uh, not just in China, but in any market, right. it, when this TikTok now has a billion plus users. Uh, so how should we think about that if we're just kind of random TikTok users sitting at home, but maybe a little concerned? Yeah. Um Actually, so TikTok is like the one tech, not the one app that I tried to use, and I just can't speak the language of it anymore. So um, I don't really. Kn I, I think it's a tough question, um, and I don't really have a, s a strong opinion on it. I think like good sources of analysis, The Guardian and Reuters, both. I think The Guardian had a good piece that looked at a memo that was leaked about their the specific censorship practices that were being used. Um, so. I think it's also important, like, to not, it's, it's important to not equivocate and not to like make false equivalences between different platforms because censoring censoring for specific political aims, um, like the Hong Kong situation, maybe is is different. I think on some level than what like Facebook does. Um, like, I think Facebook adopts the censorship practices of a lot of the countries that they're in, um, and also the extent to which filtering out hate speech is a form of censorship or not, uh, I think can be debated. But I think um, we have to make distinctions. I'm still thinking through this, but we have to look at where there are similarities and, and where there are distinctions. So it's not up my alley, but um, it's, a, it's a tough question. So here, let me try one more that's, uh, I'm kind of building toward this. I mean, the, the general, obviously, sense of uh, China from the outside is that it can act monolithically. It seems like we see examples of that with this NBA thing and with the TikTok mm. thing. Do you think that that is, even if it's maybe overstated, a sort of a source of asymmetric advantage or potentially disadvantage, but some sort of asymmetry there where when you see Trump tweet on you know a random day of the week that yeah. American companies are now hereby ordered to do whatever, everybody just kind of rolls their eyes and says, well, you don't really have the power to do that. Sure. Sure. But there does seem to be an actual center of power in China that can say, like, you're going to cancel partnerships with yeah. the NBA, yeah. and it kind of happens. So does that mean something in 
uh, this geopolitical context? Yeah, I think it. I think it definitely does mean something. Um, I think we just sometimes assume that it means China will have an advantage when oftentimes these things backfire. So a good example is also with Tencent. Um, they couldn't put any games online for about a good part, portion of the year um, because a new agency came online or a new bureaucratic player came online and thought that the video games were being too addictive for consumers. Um, whereas there's a lot of good evidence that video games are actually a crucial driver of technological um, development because it gets people interested in digital applications. Gamification can inspire a bunch of like positive spillovers um, and also hurt Tencent, one of the biggest companies. Um, and their like stock value dropped like enormously. So um, yes, it is a difference, but it's also a difference that might actually hamper China geopolitically rather than, um, uh, than, in, than empower it. So we often talk times talk about the empowerment angle, which I think is important, uh, but we sometimes ignore the ways in which these centrally guided policies actually backfire. Well, we could talk about this uh, all day, and I haven't even scratched the surface of questions coming in from the app, but uh, you'll have office hours yep. at 3 o'clock yep. at our next break, so come there to talk to Jeff about uh, all this and more. For now, how about another round of applause for Jeffrey Ding? Fascinating topic. Thank you very much. Great job.